Um, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And uh, this is going to be part three of our sutra study of the Sri Mala Deva, or Sri Mala Devi, I should say, Sri Mala Devi Simhanada Sutra, the lion's roar of Queen Sri Mala. Um, so this is part three, uh, but I am going to just quickly, in case you weren't here, or just to kind of put us back in the right frame of mind, I'm going to kind of just quickly summarize what has happened thus far um, in order to bring us right up to where we were, and we will continue. Um, and so this is a beautiful, um, it's a pretty small sutra, I'd say, as far as sutras go. Um, and it's one of the 49 sutras that are part of a collection of sutras called the Maharatnakuta collection, or the great, the great pile, or the great peak of jewels. And our Srimala Sutra, the Sutra of <clears throat> Srimala, is actually Sutra number 48. And so she is, in a way, kind of the peak of the peak, almost, as it were. Um, and so uh, we've been going through this sutra. It's a very, very famous Mahayana Buddhist sutra. And even though it's part of the Ratnakuta collection, it has a whole history and a whole life of its own, um, existing as an independent sutra with a, a great deal of popularity. Um, the origins of this sutra, the different versions of this sutra, is that's everything I covered in part one. Um, then in part two of this series is where we actually dove into the sutra itself. And the sutra is one of those Mahayana sutras that it doesn't have a huge narrative arc, but tonight I'm actually gonna try to start pointing out how it, it has more of a narrative arc than it might seem. But the narrative as it's given in the sutra is very simple. Queen Srimala, her parents, uh, King uh, Prasanajit and wife Malika, Queen Malika. So these are two historical figures, two uh, royalty of India at the time of the Buddha. And the sutra says that they the King Prasanajit and his wife Malika had just developed faith in the Buddha. And they thought to themselves, our daughter, Srimala, is super smart, super wise, super sharp, super intelligent. If she were to find out about the Dharma, if she were to find out about the truth of the Buddha, she would realize it immediately. And so, the king and the queen write Srimala a letter uh, praising the qualities or the merit or the punya of the truth of the Tathagata. There's a lot of different ways to read that, but they wrote their daughter a letter. She gets the letter extolling the virtues of the Tathagata and the Dharma, and she kind of seemingly immediately kind of grasps its meaning. And we are in a way, I think this is the way I read it last time. She sort of falls into a meditative trance in which she has a vision of the Buddha. And indeed it says that in this meditation, in this mindfulness, a state of mindfulness, out of nowhere, out of space, in, in the air, she has a vision of the Buddha radiating light. And so in this kind of rapturous state, a visionary state of seeing the Buddha, she recites uh, what would be called a gatha, a verse, a poem. And this verse is sort of about her, um, you know, she's elated. She's ecstatic. She is having this vision of the Buddha. And so the, the, the poem that she recites is about this 
wondrous body of the Buddha that she is witnessing, that she is seeing. So if you want to know more about the poem, go back to part two, because that's what we talked about last time. And I want to start here because we actually haven't fully finished chapter one yet. And so before we continue any further, we kind of need to hear what happens after Srimala gets the letter from her parents, after she sees and has a vision of the Buddha and recites her own poem, what happens then? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, at that time, Srimala and all of her attendants bowed their heads to the Buddha. The Buddha then made this prediction among the assembly. So before I read the prediction, I just want to remind you of something. If you were here for the last sutra that we talked about a few weeks ago, the about the magician Bhadra, that sutra that we talked about last time, also one of the, from the heap of jewels, right? That sutra was actually called the... Um, Bhadra Maya Kara Vyakaranya Sutra, which is a long way of saying the prediction about the magician Bhadra. And so if you were here for that sutra, that was a fairly long sutra, actually. And that whole sutra, which went through sort of these various stages of this, this guy, this magician Bhadra, these various stages of, of him kind of coming around to the Dharma. He kind of goes through these different stages of being kind of in conformity with the Dharma, and then eventually having this kind of full realization of the, the truth of the Dharma in that way. And it's at the end, it's at the end of that sutra that the Buddha makes a prediction regarding Bhadra's eventual enlightenment as a fully enlightened Buddha. And indeed, that's what a Vyakaranya is. So these Vyakaranya, the prediction of the Buddha, it's kind of, um, um, you could call it a trope. It's kind of a trope in Mahayana Buddhist sutras where different people at different times in different sutras are receiving this prophecy of, by the Buddha that they will one day go on to become a fully enlightened Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, and have their own Buddha land. So this is a trope. It's something that happens in Mahayana sutras. What I want you to notice, though, regarding last week's or sorry, a few weeks ago regarding the Bhadra Sutra, it, it took the whole sutra and all of these different moments. And then finally, Bhadra gets the prediction. Some, you know, someday kid, you're gonna be a Buddha, right? What I want you to notice is that in this sutra, Sri Mala, she gets it right away. So, this is kind of another um, aspect of this sutra. If you remember from my introduction or from the introduction, Srimala's parents said, our daughter is very clever, very sharp, very, very bright. She'll get the Dharma immediately. And sure enough, she does. And so I just wanted you to remember that from the last sutra or kind of be aware that this is a trope the prediction of enlightenment. But now let's listen to Sri Mala's. So then the Buddha made this prediction among the assembly. To Sri Mala, she, he says, you praise the punya, the merit of the truth of the Tathagata, of the thus come one. And by these virtuous roots, in immeasurable asamkya kalpas, eons and eons from now, you will be a sovereign royal among gods. And in each of those lives, you will always see me 
manifesting before you in manning, manifesting before your praise, no different than right now. You will again make offerings to immeasurable Asamkhya Buddhas over 10,000 Asamkhya Kalpas until you eventually attain Buddhahood, being called Samanta Prabha Tathagata, universal light, thus come one, Arahat Samyak Sambhutta. That Buddha land or your Buddha land will be without any evil rebirths or destinies, without aging, disease, decay, vexation, and without any uncontrollable thoughts of dread. It won't even have names for unvirtuous evil acts. <laughs> the people of that land will have strength and longevity, their five sensual desires fulfilled with rare pleasures, greater than the gods of the heaven where lords met, where greater than the gods of the heaven who lord over the emanations of others. These people are purely one great vehicle in Ekya Mahayana, all practicing the development of virtuous roots, all the people gathering there. When Queen Srimala received this prediction from the Buddha, immeasurable beings, gods, and humans all wished to be reborn in that land. And the world honored one predicted that they would all be reborn there. Okay, that's the end of chapter one. That's the prediction of Srimala that she will, in immeasurable Asamkhya, like gajillion, or gajillion, I think is how what Asamkhya translates to. So, in immeasurable gajillions of kalpas, Srimala will become a Tathagata, a Buddha named Samanta Prabha, universal light. <laughs> okay, so before we move to chapter two, I wanna kind of ease you into what's about to happen. So what's about to happen can, it can th throw a lot of people off, all right? And so this is what I meant in the beginning where there's a way to read the narrative of this um, the, uh, a little differently than um, just like a story. And what I mean is, is this. So I want to go back for a second and I want to talk about, and get ready, we have animation tonight. So this is, this is the magic word for tonight, all right? This parigraha, right? So this is a word that um, well, I want us to pay very particular attention to. It's one of those beautiful um, kind of serendipitous things that happens when, when you read sutras. So we need to go back just a moment before the Buddha predicts Srimala's enlightenment. I want to go back really quickly to her poem. So I mentioned in the beginning, she receives a letter from her parents. She reads the letter, has a vision of the Buddha and recites a poem. Uh, see, chapter, see part two for that whole poem. But the very last thing she says, the very last line of her poem is she says, I solely wish to be accepted. And I, I, when I read that poem last time, it was kind of the end of the end of the night. And so I kind of glossed it. I wanted to save it and kind of dig deeper into it. So in the various English translations, and um, I'm reading from my translation, but there's all these other English translations. And most people translate this, these two Chinese characters combined, most people translate it as accept. And 
in reading the last line of her poem where she says, my sole wish, my only desire, my only vow, my only wish is for parigraha. And I mentioned, I think at some point um, that, you know, you notice this word, it's one of those things that really sticks out in the poem. It's again, it's the very last line, the very last two characters of her poem is this idea that it's her sole wish is this. And, you know, of course you read that and you're wondering, well, then what, you know, I'm very curious about what that is, if that's your only desire, if that's your sole wish. And I introduced this idea to you because it's about to become more and more significant as this suture goes on until actually chapter four, the title of chapter four is Parigraha, is this idea. So it, it actually really culminates in that chapter. So what does this word mean? You got me. Uh, it, may, it means a, a lot of different things. So let's just take the first character here. So this one that I'm pointing at. So this character, this Chinese character, you see it around. And it's usually a Chinese Buddhist translation for a Sanskrit word called samgraha, samgraha. You add this character to it and it becomes a modified word of parigraha. But let's go back to this idea. So I've mentioned before that this interesting little Chinese character, the, the root of it, the radical as it's called, the root meaning of this word is on the side and it's a little picture of a hand holding a stick. And that is actually next to, and if you have, you know, little pattern recognition, you'll notice it's the same character three times. And it's a picture of an ear, actually. It's three ears. And if you go looking up like the deeper, more classical meaning of this word, you start to get the sense that it's a conductor harmonizing a group of voices so that they sound alike. It, in a very, very, very old classical Chinese, it has that kind of meaning of harmonize. And I think it's really helpful to keep that in mind. Now, it can mean other things too, and it can mean to accept, but it can also mean, especially when you combine it with this character, this character means to receive to be on the receiving end of something in that sense. And when you put these two together, it can actually mean an embrace. It can mean accept, like being offered something and accepting it. It can also mean together absorb. So start to put all of those ideas together, absorbing, harmonizing, accepting, embracing, um, check my notes. Yeah, so those are sort of the primary meanings of the, this word and this two character combination to, to, to bring it in and kind of absorb, harmonize in that sense. So that's her only desire. Okay, to be embraced, to be accepted, to be received, to be in harmony. Again, let's keep all of those in mind. Let's not try to narrow it down, but let's broaden our minds in that sense. So that's her only wish. And then based upon making that declaration, the Buddha prophecies makes this prediction that she'll eventually become a fully enlightened Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha. Let's now jump to chapter two. So the title of chapter two is where this starts to get tricky. The title of chapter two is called, and let's just check, let's check one of our standard English translations here and they call it probably, that's a stretch. So we're not gonna use that one, but, <laughs> but the idea is, is that most, most people, 
understand this chapter as being called the 10 precepts. All right. So let's get to it. Boom. So this is the, the idea. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see because now it's very small, but these are the 10 precepts. And the title of this chapter is the number 10. This is the Chinese character for the number 10. It's just a cross in that way. And then the other character is actually the same character as this. All right. So the plot thickens. So we have this word, this word. So don't look at this one. We're only interested in this one now. And this is that word I mentioned that means it's a very simple word. You, you, you would use it a lot in Chinese. It's one of those very standard words. And it means to receive something. So that's what the word means, to receive. But now we need to do something a little technical, OK? And what we need to do is this is something that would be called her hermeneutics. So this is kind of a sub branch of the study of language. And hermeneutics is a fancy word that means it's about how words are used. It's like, yeah, sure, we know that this word means to receive. That's what it means. But how is it used within different times, different cultures? So for example, this is a medieval Chinese Buddhist lay community. How do, the, how do medieval lay Chinese Buddhists use this word? What does it mean to them? when they say receive. And well, if you, if you wanna know, and I'll, I'll share more about this in a second, but this word is the word that you would use when you take a series of vows or precepts actually. So the idea of, in Buddhism, you may be aware that there is the idea of these various precepts. Call them rules, observations might be another way of putting it. But, you know, the standard list, which I, it's going to come up sort of. Um, but the basic idea is that within the world of Buddhism, there are traditionally five precepts that one agrees to, or in the language of this text, five precepts that they receive, that they accept in that way. Uh, not taking life, otherwise known as not killing, not taking what has not been given, otherwise known as stealing, not taking sexuality. And you, know, you could read that how you like, but the idea of not taking it, it's probably a good way of thinking about it, sexual impropriety or sex at all, depending on the community you're talking to. Uh, harsh speech, false speech, bad speech is number four. And number five is about stupefying intoxicants, basically getting drunk or drunk to the point of stupefaction in that way. So those are the traditional five precepts of being a Buddhist that one would receive. And again, in, within the world of Chinese Buddhism, this character is the character for that. And so this chapter is called the 10 those. <laughs> and so you, you would normally call it a precept, but the word means receive. And so I've kind of made up a word of a, of a recept. I don't think we have such a word, but these are like the 10 recepts, the 10 things that one receives in that way. So let's get into this chapter. So this is chapter two. This is immediately after the Buddha predicts that Sri Mala is going to become a Buddha. Everybody, everybody there, right? What did it say? Let's read it again. When Queen Sri Mala received this prediction, immeasurable beings, gods, and humans wish to be reborn in that land. And the world honored one predicted that they would all be reborn there. I think that a 
a narrative gap that needs to be filled in here is that chapter two begins when Srimala heard this prediction, she respectfully arose from her seat to receive these 10 great recepts or these 10 great precepts. The narrative gap that I want to fill in here <laughs> is it's kind of this idea that if the idea of strength, longevity, having all of one's desires fulfilled, living in a world without aging, disease, decay, vexation, and uncontrollable thoughts of dread, if all of that sounds good to you and you too, would like to be reborn in the pure land, Buddha world, Buddha land of Tathagata, uh, universal light. If you'd like to be reborn there, then it might behoove you to think about these 10 recepts or precepts. <laughs> so that's sort of the narrative gap I want to fill in between chapter one and chapter two. Yes, these are Srimala's 10 great precepts in that way but they might also be yours. Um, yeah, and actually, before I even read these, because I'm going to go through them one by one, and I want to kind of break down what they mean or how to understand them. Before I get into that, though, um, well, actually, I can read the first one because the first one pertains to this. So this will get us going. So Srimala arises from her seat and receives, receives, these 10 great recepts. Number one, world honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening, Bodhi, I will not give rise to an offensive mind toward precepts I have received. Period. Okay. So that, that first one right there needs a little bit of clarification. So what's going on here, what these 10 precepts are, are they would be, they would be referred to as bodhisattva vows. Now, what I want you to know though, is, is that there are kind of 10, and then sometimes there's 48, or sometimes there's 42 and 52. It depends on the tradition. But there are series, series, is, is, series of different bodhisattva vows. They come from different sutras. Again, there's different numbers of them. In the modern world, the, the various bodhisattva precepts have kind of been standardized. But again, they've been standardized within certain traditions and other traditions use a different bodhisattva vow. Regardless, the thing that I want to tell you about these, the thing that I want to tell you about bodhisattva vows in general, is that within Buddhist communities, at least all of the Buddhist communities I've been a part of, bodhisattva vows are always on top of the regular vow. So in other words, if you're a lay Buddhist and you've taken those five precepts I just mentioned, right, then your bodhisattva vows would usually be on top of those. They're not in place of them, they're on top of them. And then even if you're not a lay Buddhist observing just the five precepts, but let's say you are a novice monastic or you're a lay person participating in a monastic retreat for a week or two or a month, then you might take the 10 precepts, which are the five precepts I just mentioned against killing, stealing, uh, rape, sexual misconduct, uh, false speech, and intoxication, those five, and if you're a novice monastic or you are a, a lay person participating in a retreat, you'll tack on five extra precepts, uh, not eating after noon, not sleeping on a high bed, not wearing garlands or perfumes or cosmetics, not touching gold or silver, 
And there's one more monkish one. I can't remember what it is. I should have written down. I apologize for that. Um, it's along the lines of go, um, it might be, oh yeah, it's the one about not going to entertainment, not going to the shows in that way. So, you know, and if you're participating in a meditation retreat, maybe you're, you're going to be going to shows, right? I don't know. But the idea is, is that you have the five big ones that I've now mentioned twice. These five kind of monkish ones that novice monastics or lay people participating in a retreat observe. If you're observing the 10 precepts, you would take your bodhisattva vows on top of those. And then even if you're a fully ordained monk or nun, and you've taken the 200 plus monastic precepts, the bodhisattva vows would be on top of those as well. So just want you to know that we're really talking about vows and precepts tonight. Um, if there's any questions about vows or precepts, tonight is definitely the night to ask them. And regarding all of that, I want you to know that when the first one of these, the first, these says, world honored one, from this day until awakening, I will not give rise to a disrespectful mind towards, sorry, or an offensive mind towards the precepts I have received. It's saying, I vow to not break the rules that I have taken before this, either the five, the 10, or the 200, or so on. But there's also a way that this first precept is kind of like self-referential in that way, where it's saying like, first vow, I vow not to break my vows, <laughs> right? So you can read it either the first that way or the first way, kind of a thing. Um, Linguistically, I want to make a point. I tried to capture it here. These are basically my summaries of these 10. I'm going to, of course, read them in full. But I wanted you to know that regarding these 10 bodhisattva precepts, let's call them that, the first five are all written in the same structure. And what the structure is, is it's about regarding, like regarding my precepts, I vow not to give rise to a disrespectful mind. So all the first five of these, they're all about in regard to this, I vow not to give rise to a certain type of mind. So these are all five of these are in the negative, but they're in the negative in terms of not giving rise to certain types of chitta. The word would be chitta, a mind state. So regarding precepts, I won't give rise to a transgressive or offensive state of mind, which is kind of just a very complicated way of saying, I vow not to break or transgress my precepts. Number two, world honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening, and all of these precepts begin the same way, from this day until I arrive at awakening, I will not give rise to a disrespectful mind towards elders. So far, so good, right? Um, keeping precepts, if you've taken them. That's a pretty good vow, right? If you've taken precepts, keep them. Number two, respect elders. Who wants to live in a world where we don't respect elders, right? So I'm, I'm down with number two. I'm down with number two. I'm down with number one. Um, again, the idea is, is that it's written in that way of towards elders. I vow not to give rise to a disrespectful mind. So far, so good. First five, these first five are pretty straightforward. Number three is world honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening, I will not give rise to a hateful mind towards any being, towards anyone or any being, any creature. So not to give rise to transgressive or an offensive mind, not to give rise to a disrespectful mind, 
and not to give rise to a hateful mind. I'm good with that. Everybody, I'm, go I'm good with, uh, with the no hate. I don't want to live in a hate-filled world. So, right? Check. Number four. World 101. From this day until I arrive at awakening, I will not give rise to a jealous mind toward others, other people's physical appearance or their possessions. I will not give rise to a jealous mind state regarding other people's physical appearance or their possessions. Pretty straightforward, right? Especially if you've been coming to Dharma doors and you know what this Buddhism stuff is all about. Being jealous of other people's stuff is probably not the way to go. Right? It's just so that's that. So jealousy, who needs it? Right? All right. Number five, world honorable. From this day until I arrive at awakening. I will not give rise to a stingy or covetous mind toward anything inside or out. So the fifth one there is about giving rise to a desirous, covetous, uh, stingy mind. But interestingly, it says, I'm not going to be covetous towards anything inside or out. Very interesting. So the one before this was about jealousy regarding other people, the way they look, the things they have, right? Stay away from Instagram if you're trying to follow that precept, right? It's a dangerous place for jealousy towards other people's appearance and other people's belongings, right? So the idea is, is that was very much about like other people, the way they look or the things they have. This fifth one is about this desirousness and covetousness, but it says towards anything inside or out. And, you know, that is a very, very subtle one. So outwardly, covetous is sort of this idea. And you could also, again, the, the Chinese at least could be read as like stingy in that sense. So you're kind of like hoarding or keeping. And as far as external stuff goes, so this isn't about being desirous of other people's things. This is actually having something, but not wanting to share it, right? Just being over here, uh, again, kind of stingily or covetously keeping your whatever it might be. But then it also says inside and out. And so this is kind of an interesting, or at least one way to interpret it, I should say, this is kind of an interesting way of looking at how that, what do you want to call it? I guess call it a chitta, a mind state, how that mind state of clingy, stingy attachment in that way, noticing how it can function in terms of stuff and belongings but it functions also deeply inwardly. And again, that can you know, be understood a number of different ways, but what one way to think of it, one interpretation, is really about a sort of um, over-attachment and stingy relationship to one's own body. So to the point you know, where, I, I don't know, maybe you get a, a bad tooth and it starts to fall out and you are like, no, not my tooth because there's this really deep sense of clinging to who we think we are and maybe aging or whatever it might be and so again it's an interesting reflection on how covetousness can function both inwardly and outwardly we do it towards our own body in various different ways and also do it externally towards uh, possessions in that sense all right, we are moving right along. Uh, any questions, answers, comments, or ideas about the first five? Pretty like basic Buddhist stuff there, right? You probably uh, um, kind of caught 
a smell, a sniff, smell, a scent of our of our three poisons there. The greed, anger, and delusion are wrapped up in those. Um, I think there's a lot of different interesting ways to understand th those first five. Um, again, you can understand them in a really basic Buddhist way. There's just about the classics, greed, anger, delusion, jealousy, all of that. But then there's deeper ways to understand them as well. Um, so yeah, we're very good. Excellent, beautiful. Now we move on to these last five. And these are a little more complicated. They're not written in the same uh, grammatical structure that the first five were. And by the way, I also mentioned that I am uh, using Prince Shotoku's commentary on the Srimala Sutra. So this is a famous uh, medieval Japanese commentary on this sutra, and it's very helpful for uh, filling in a lot of blanks and ideas. And even Prince Shotoku loves to divide up these 10 precepts into a bunch of different ways. So it's a very, um, it's a very traditional way of reading these precepts to divide them into different uh, categories. And so now we move into number six. World honored one. From this day, until I arrive at awakening, I will not accept things for my own sake. I will only accept things for the welfare of the poor and suffering. So this is a slightly higher order of precept in that way. In particular, though, I want you to know that the um, it's a, a few of the other English translations um, focus on it. It's not it's not explicitly in the Chinese, so I will I prefer just to mention it in, the, in this kind of commentary. This sixth this sixth precept where it says I will not accept things for my own sake. The connotation is very much about the accumulation of wealth. And, and Prince Shotoku's commentary, everybody's commentary on this precept. This precept is clearly directed towards what would be called householders, lay people. Of course, Queen Srimala, she's the queen of her own uh, country, her own region in uh, northern India, we are to understand. And so this is an interesting precept for lay uh lay devotees in that sense. And the precept is about not amassing wealth for one's own sake, but ultimately only amassing wealth for the sake of others. It specifically says for the uh, poor and suffering, but of course, from a Buddhist point of view, we're all suffering. So that's all, all of us in that sense, right? So that's the idea here is, is that it's about all right, bodhisattvas, all right, householders, lay Buddhists, we recognize that you're not going to be a monastic and not, ac not accumulate wealth at all. <laughs> so if you're going to be a, uh, a, a lay Buddhist, if you're going to be a householder, this precept is about, yeah, you can go ahead and accumulate wealth, but it should be done so with the big goal in mind of helping others out. Right? So not for its own sake in that way. Feeling good? Cool. Number seven, world honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening. Not for myself, but for all sentient beings, will I practice the four means of unification, as they are usually called, with an untainted mind, an insatiable mind, a fearless mind, harmoniously embracing or accepting all beings. Okay, this one's gonna require some, um, some references to be filled in. 
so the, the, the focus of this one, and I forget what I wrote here exactly, probably just the, the four means of harmony, maybe. So this is a word. So these are the four samgraha. And what her vow, what her seventh precept is, is that she says that I will practice the four samgraha, this word. I will practice the four samgraha, not for myself, but for the welfare of all. And so this is where it might help if you know what the four means of unification is. So the four means of unification are, the first is generosity. Yes, giving, donating, but we're really talking about being generous. G giving, for sure. That's the first means of samgraha, the means of unification, as these are sometimes called, means of embracing, means of absorbing. And I want to bring in my preferred translation, which is the means of harmonizing. So I'm still sticking to the idea, even though I wrote absorb here, because that's the standard English translation of this. I want you to know that you could think of it as harmonizing and harmony in a way. And so these four means of harmonizing, the four means of bringing people together, once again, they are giving, kind speech, volunteerism, and fourth, cooperation, working together. So that fourth one is cooperating, working together. The third one is actually volunteering to help people with their situation, their endeavors. The second one is kind speech as a means of harmonizing, a means of unification. And then again, the first one is that idea of generosity or giving. Those are four practices of the bodhisattva. And they are, in particular, they are four means of, and there are other sutras that talk about these four means of unification. These are the four means of bringing groups of people together in harmony. And so the idea is, is that bodhisattvas, the, these amazing bodhisattvas that are part of this Mahayana tradition, these are the techniques for going into divided communities, communities with division, it's these are the techniques that bodhisattvas use to go in and make peace and make harmony. So Srimala says, I vow to practice those four means of samgraha, those four means of harmonizing, not for myself though, but for the sake of all beings. And I will do so with an untainted mind an insatiable mind, a fearless mind, and I will do it to harmonize all beings. So, by the way, this, this word, it starts to appear more and more and more within this idea. So, I, again, I'm, I'm highlighting it for a reason. Everybody feeling good about that? Any questions about the four means of unification? Awesome. Okay. All right. The eighth precept or recept, the eight, is World Honored One. This, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. So, World Honored One, from this day until I arrive at awakening, seeing or upon seeing the orphaned, the lonely, the cut off, the vexed, the sick, the ill, the restricted, the inhibited, those besieged or those suffering, I will never give up on them, only wanting to lead them to peace and by reason enriching them, causing them to escape the mass of suffering, and only then afterwards give them up. Okay, that's the precept. 
there's a lot of interesting language things going on here that I really, I, I wish I, you know, I, I wish I could do more. I, I really do in, in bringing how interesting this is to, to light. So, so the, fir the first part's pretty easy. She says, upon seeing the orphan, the lonely, the cut off, you know, Statue of Liberty stuff, right? Just she, if bring me your tired, your poor, your sick, your vexed, she's on it, right? So seeing all of those, those suffering, and this is where the, the language is really funny because what she says is, is that upon seeing them, she says, I'll never give up on them. Only wanting to lead them to peace, enriching them, causing them to, to escape the mass of suffering. And then the sentence ends and it basically kind of flips the two Chinese characters where it said, I will never give up on them. I'll do all this stuff and only then will I let them go. And it's a funny, uh, it's, it's just beautifully written, first of all, but something for me comes immediately to mind and it's a beautiful, uh, very classic Zen Buddhist story. And if you don't know this Zen Buddhist story, I think it'll really help uh, clarify and, and make very interesting that last part of it, where she says, and only then will I let them go. So the Zen story is, there's this famous Zen story about the, the elder master and the young acolyte student. And they're walking along together one day and they come to the edge of a river, small river, creek. And they both see a woman standing on the side of the river, timidly trying to cross over. The two monks, the elder and the younger approach. And all of a sudden, the elder monk, the senior monk, the master, takes the woman, offers her his hand, she takes it, he helps her over the river. Then they all go off. As they walk off, the young acolyte is sitting there shocked. He just witnessed his master break one of the precepts. So one of those 200 precepts I mentioned for monastics, men and women, are not allowed to touch one another. When you sign up to be a monk, you say, I will not touch a, a member of the female sex again. And then when you sign up to be a nun, you say, I will no longer touch a member of the male sex. It's part of the precepts. So the young monk who, you know, he just took the precepts. He knows all of them by heart, right? He's freaking out because he just saw his master touch and hold this woman and carry her across the river. At a certain point, he just, he can't take it. And so he stops and he says, master, I can't take it anymore. You touched that woman. You, you held on to that woman. And the master wisely turns and says, I did. And I left her at the side of the river. Are you still carrying her? So lovely Zen story about upaya, about skillful means. In particular, the, a lovely Zen comment on when it is acceptable to break precepts, when it, in a way when it's not, so to speak. But in particular, it has to do with that lovely last line. Are you still carrying her? Because I let her go at the side of the river. That's how I read the last part of this. It's actually how I read the whole precept. So let's go back and review. Again, seeing the orphaned, the lonely, the cut off, the vexed, the sick, the ill, the restricted, the inhibited, those besieged or suffering. I will never give up on them, only wanting to lead them to peace and by reason enrich them causing them to escape the mass of suffering and only then afterwards giving them up. Hmm? Okay. Everybody good? Tanya. 
So I mean, and maybe this is, I mean, I think it's probably consistent with the with the story you were just telling, but of the Zen story. But I was also just thinking of like, you know, not when they say giving them up, but like not becoming attached to them or not becoming attached to them in a way that like is stroking your own ego. Like I did all this great stuff for these people, you know? So it's just like, you just do it and you let it go. Yep. That's how I would read it. That as well. Absolutely. So let's pay attention. Everybody else good? Uh-huh. Cool. So. Oh, sorry, Michael. I have yeah, a yeah, question. Annette. So. Um, do you interpret that to mean like she's going to help them all the way to an awakened state or to the immediate, like, causes? Oh, you know? I think we're to understand it where it's sort of about on the spot, where coming across someone who is orphaned or coming across someone in the, one of those situations, help them out then, and then move, keep it moving, as they say. Yeah, I think it's not so much about taking each one by the hand all the way to enlightenment. I think it's about if it crosses your path, someone in need, then the desire is to help. And then with that interesting twist of, and then letting them go. Yeah. Okay, so I make, I'm making such a big deal about the letting them go. This, um, and by the way, before I do that, I want you to know the character, the Chinese character that I just mentioned that's being moved around where it says that I will never give up on them and but then only then let them go. That word, the, the actual Chinese character, and I didn't want to bother you with too much of the Chinese here, but I want you to know it is the word that is used to describe letting go, relinquishing. In, in, the, in the grand Buddhist sense of like not being attached, but rather uh, show, I believe it's, sh is it? uh, show, this idea of, of letting go in that way. So I want you to know that this word is very significant to traditional Buddhism. It's this idea of, of relinquishing, um, abandoning, but in that good sense, meaning in terms of attachment. So I say all of that because number nine gets very interesting. World honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening, seeing those who practice entrapment or evil ways or evil customs and observing all those who break precepts, I will never reject them. When I have the power and I am in those places and I see those people, I will tame the tameable and harmoniously receive or embrace the harmoniously receivable, those that can be harmoniously received. And how will I do that? Or, and why I should say, and why? By taming and harmoniously receiving or embracing, it causes the Dharma to continuously abide. When the Dharma continuously abides, gods and humans flourish, evil ways diminish, and all the gods and humans are able to attain the perpetual turning of the Dharma wheel turned by the thus come one. Seeing the benefits of this, I seek harmony, not rejection. Okay. So again, there's, were, there's two different ideas that are playing out in this paragraph, in this precept. One is the character I just mentioned, which means to abandon, reject, let go of. And what it says here is, or she says that not until I reach awakening, that when I see people doing evil things or practicing entrapment or just kind of like trying to ensnare people in nonsense in that way, right? Or I see people breaking precepts, 
she says, I will never reject them, abandon them, and never show, and never abandon them in that way. Then she says this great thing of when I have the power and I'm in those places and I see those people, I will tame the tameable and harmoniously receive samgraha, actually parigraha. I will parigraha those who can be parigrahad in that sense. So a word about that, the word tame. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really interesting idea in, in Buddhism. So, you know, Buddhas, enlightened beings in this tradition, they have these 10 um, epithets, titles, uh, Buddha, Tathagata, Arhat, Samyaksambuddha, uh, teacher of gods and men. And one of them is, it's a title of a Buddha, a title of an enlightened being, and it's, it's a funny title. You know how we have the English word lion tamer? Someone who tames a lion? Well, a Buddha is a human tamer. <laughs> tamer of humans is the, is the title. And I think that's a really kind of interesting perspective on humanity in that sense, in terms of being having animalistic uh, tendencies, let's call them, and that a human beings can be tamed in that sense. Now, within sutras and within the world of Buddhism, what they are really talking about is, and is described as such, is taming the mind. Noticing that the mind can be like a wild animal, a, a, a kind of a Chinese Buddhist saying is the mind being like a drunk monkey, drum, jumping from branch to branch, constantly seeking desire here and there. And so to control that mind that just jumps, jumps from sense pleasure to sense pleasure, to control that mind, Buddhists use the language of taming, <laughs> like taming the mind in that way. So when Srimala says, I'm going to go into those places when I have the power and tame the tameable, I, even though I just made the whip sound, I don't think you should imagine her going into places and like a lion tamer. It's more about teaching. It's about teaching the Dharma. A lot of this is about sharing, teaching the Dharma. In fact, this ends with that beautiful statement that in this way, all these beings attain the perpetual turning of the Dharma wheel, all right? So taming those that can be tamed basically means teaching those that are willing to learn, teaching those that are willing to learn. And she says, parigraha, absorbing, embracing, harmonizing those that can be harmonized. In other words, those that are already on board, making friends, embracing, coming together in harmony. So that's the vow. <laughs> the vow again is this language of not rejecting people. It's a beautiful sentiment. I, I would read that as well, or I would interpret that as when one sees someone breaking precepts or what have you. I think the Bodhisattva attitude is not one of good luck with that. <laughs> Karma's a bitch. <laughs> have fun. It's actually about having uh, a sense of, of obligation in that way, right? So that's sort of, I mean, again, there's a lot going on with this, um, with this number nine. And all this all culminates in this very wonderful last line. And I got to tell you, um, I don't think any other English translation has paid as much attention to this word as I have, because most of the translations are just kind of just translating it all over the place. And I think that when you don't pay attention to the significance of this word, 
you might miss the beauty and the significance of that last line. So she basically says, I'm going to go into those places when I have the power, teach the teachable, embrace the embraceable in that way, and thus create this sort of a perpetual self-turning Dharma wheel. Amazing. And she says, so seeing the benefit of that, seeing the benefit of a self-perpetuating, self-turning Dharma wheel, seeing the benefits of this, it says, she says, I seek harmony, not rejection. And again, when you know that the word for rejection is like, that's the Buddhist word for like what we're trying to do. This sutra fully presents itself as a Mahayana sutra and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not into rejecting stuff. We're in actually into this kind of harmony idea. And I think that it's a very, very, <clears throat> it's a it's a powerful statement. It's a, that last sentence is so powerful. Yeah, no. Are you saying that when she says, when she says, I will not reject, and you're saying that that is an original, like in a, a Hinayana idea, <clears throat> the idea is that you should get away from the world, reject the world, and isolate yourself, your senses, your everything. That that, that is what on some level the, the Hinayana is saying to do? Is that what you're saying? The early Hinayana is definitely saying yeah. abandon and reject this yeah. world fully yeah. 100%. Yeah. And the Mahayana is saying, well, in general, the Mahayana is saying is don't do that. This is the yeah. idea that bodhisattvas don't rush off into nirvana, yeah. but they're, you know, yeah. all of that. What I want to point out though, or what I want to make clear the sentence is very straightforward. She says, I seek harmony, not rejection, yeah. but it's the subtle implication. Yeah. So I want to make clear, it's a very subtly implied comment. Yeah. But it's going to, again, it's going to play out in this whole sutra where the whole sutra is ultimately about harmonizing or embracing. I, I want to say one other thing. I, I've been thinking about this since the beginning and I, since I have myself unmuted, I'm just going to say it now. It's interesting to me that in English we say taking vows, but mm. apparently in Chinese, or at least in the sutra, we're talking about receiving them. And that's, that's a subtle difference, but it's a difference. And it, it seems to me like uh, she she received this letter. Like she didn't you know, go out and get a letter. It just came to her, right? And then she's like, had this vision and now she's like wanting to receive all these precepts. Like, it seems like she's, these are all things that will train her. Like she's gonna, uh, how is she eventually gonna be a Buddha by practicing all these things? And so she's sort of, um, availing herself of this opportunity receipt of receiving of having received this teaching something like that yes gnome and and everything that you're saying makes me want to emphasize something so at the beginning of the talk i was talking about how uh, bodhisattva precepts are always on top of your normal precepts and in the dharma doors i'm often um, often talking about the Hinayana versus the Mahayana, early Buddhism versus this sort of, of more later Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism. And part of that discourse about early Buddhism, later Buddhism, part of the discourse is that early Buddhism is kind of criticized, if you will, for being a tradition of, uh, a, of self-enlightenment. It's techniques for you to get enlightened. It's meditation techniques to work on your mind. It's things you can do with your breath. It's about you doing you and perfecting you and becoming enlightened for you. 
Everybody else is on their own in that early Hinayana in a way. We are all in a, in a way alone in that sense in the early tradition. And what the Mahayana tradition sort of comes out of is a realization that that's short-sighted. It's short-sighted because it's really only self-serving ultimately and kind of has a lot of egoistic pitfalls going on in that realm. And so what happens is, is that the Mahayana tradition, it doesn't abandon, it doesn't reject the early tradition. It adds to it. <laughs> and so that's, again, represented in that very first precept where she says, yeah, I'm, I, I vow to observe all my early precepts for sure. And so what I want you to notice about all 10 of these is that they're all about engaging with other people, not being jealous of other people's stuff, being generous when you see orphaned people or vexed people, or you see this or that. It's all about engaging with the other. And by the way, all of these is, you know, what uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the famous, brilliant uh, Zen, uh, Vietnamese Zen master, this is what they would call socially engaged Buddhism, where we're in society, we're accumulating wealth. What should I, how should I do that? How should I do that properly in that way? So I just want you to notice that all 10 of these are, and I guess we haven't gotten to the 10th one. We haven't got to that one, but they're all concerning this kind of uh, social cohesion in that sense. Something that the early tradition was not entirely invested in. So, yeah, Annette. Could you talk a little bit about how this concept of harmony is the same or different from equanimity? The Oh yeah, I, equanimity is going to be very much about how the individual views everything. And by everything, I mean everything. And equanimity or upeksha is about our tendencies to privilege this over that, to favor this over that, to put things into categories of useful, not useful, beautiful, ugly, good, bad. Equanimity is about viewing all things in a kind of equanimous way, in an equal sense, where everything is a little more just uh, what it is, but not judged so much. Upeksha, equanimity is a way of viewing reality that is sort of, you know, an enlightened mode. The unenlightened mode is the one is like, no, 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 just the big juicy ones. I hate the little bitter ones, just the big juicy ones. <laughs> That's a divided mind and, and non-equanimity in that sense. This samgraha, this embracing, it really is about like, you know, again, it's why I really like the, um, I, I like using the meaning of harmony and harmonizing with this because it's this idea of like a group of people where, oh, okay. And then I, I see where you're getting at now, how there is a deep, a deep equanimous thing going on with this Samgraha business, but the Samgraha is more about, um, I, I would actually just to, to tie it uh, together, I would suggest that the harmonizing, the samgraha, is about trying to instill a type of equanimity in others versus the equanimity that we may or may not already have ourselves in that way. Great question, Annette. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's definitely get through all 10 of these. So, Number 10, world honored one. From this day until I arrive at awakening, I will always be in harmony, parigraha, with the true dharma, never forgetting it. And why? The one who forgets the true dharma forgets the Mahayana, the great vehicle. And the one who forgets the great vehicle forgets the paramitas. And the one who forgets the paramitas doesn't want a great vehicle. 
if bodhisattvas are unclear or indecisive about the Mahayana, about the great vehicle, then they are unable to attain harmony with the desire for the true Dharma and are just following their own pleasures, never getting out of the ordinary stages. I see immeasurable failures like this, but I also see coming in the future immeasurable benefits of bodhisattva mahasattvas in harmony with the true dharma. Therefore, I receive these 10 great precepts. Okay. So number 10, it comes all down to this idea of parigraha, but in particular, this idea of being in harmony or absorbing or embracing or accepting the true dharma. And then it has this thing about because those who forget the true dharma forget the Mahayana. And if you forget the Mahayana, you forget the paramitas. And if you forget the paramitas, you obviously don't want a, a Mahayana, obviously. So that idea. So we are introduced here explicitly to this Mahayana that I have been talking about, this idea of the great vehicle. And before I remind you of, of this, I just want to say, so everything that I just was saying, which that wonderful serendipitous thing happened where I said a bunch of stuff that I didn't mean to say, but I'm glad I said it. So this idea of, so this idea of the, the great vehicle, Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta keep this short. Everything I was just talking about, about a type of Buddhism that is only interested in one's own enlightenment versus a Mahayana Buddhism where one is actually not only interested in everyone's enlightenment, actually committed to everyone's enlightenment, but not only that, that commitment to everyone's enlightenment is out of coming from a place of wisdom that recognizes that there's actually no enlightenment until all are enlightened. And that's why they call it the great vehicle. That's why they call it the Mahayana. And again, without making this too complicated, it's a very simple but very profound um, turning of the heart, turning of the heart outward. We, we, in English, we might call it altruism, right? This idea of actually being concerned about other people, <laughs> like actually not being, you know, fully self-involved, narciss narcissistic, sociopathic, whatever, not being totally self-absorbed, but actually being like concerned about other people deeply. And not only that, actually realizing that it is better for everybody. It's better for me and you for me to do that. And it's actually bad for everybody, me and you, when we are more guarded, self-absorbed, covetous, stingy, hateful, disrespectful, all of those things actually cause us to suffer and cause others to suffer. So the realization again is, oh, oh, then there, it's, it's obvious what's to be done here then. That is this sort of coming to this understanding of what Mahayana Buddhism really means. It's not actually about uber generosity per se, it's about uber wisdom in that sense. So here, when it says, if bodhisattvas are indecisive about the great vehicle, 
then they will be unable to attain harmony with the true Dharma. In other words, if being indecisive about the Mahayana is kind of having that mind of, but maybe I should be a little selfish. Maybe it would help me a little bit just to be selfish. Or maybe this Buddha thing, this Buddha guy is crazy. And I, so if you're on the fence about this whole helping everybody or not, right? Then that's the idea of a bodhisattva being indecisive about the Mahayana, indecisive about the great vehicle, and therefore unable to attain harmony or unable to absorb the true Dharma. In other words, they're just following their own pleasures, never getting out of the ordinary stages. And if you were to ask me, the ordinary stages is a, is a kind of a little jab at that Hinayana where they're like, oh, are you an, are you an Arhat yet? <laughs> like, oh, so those ordinary stages versus this whole uh, Bodhisattva path of the Mahayana. All right, that's actually it. That's the end of chapter two. We did it. Oh no, it's not the end of chapter two. We have a little prologue, little a little end here, uh, ender here. Perfect, got a little time. So, Dharma Raja, she says, Lord of the Dharma, world honored one, thou have manifested before me. And I realize with only the Buddha, the world honored one as my witness. Beings' good roots are few and poor. They weave a continuous net of doubt and are difficult to rescue by way of these 10 great vows or these 10 great receptions. In the long night of ignorance, being with, without benefit, being without meaning, not attaining bliss, it is for them that I now, before the Buddha, make these true vows. I receive these 10 great precepts or these 10 great receptions, practicing as you have explained. And due to this vow, among the assembled, may heavenly flowers rain down and heavenly music arise. And when this was said, heavenly flowers rained down from the sky and wondrous music arose. And the Buddha said, so it is, so it is. It is as you have said, it is true, no different. Seeing these wondrous flowers and hearing this wondrous sound, those assembled were completely freed of doubt. And with immeasurable joy, they exclaimed and generated a vow saying, we wish to stay with Sri Mala forever, practicing with her. And the world honored one predicted that it would be just as they wished. All right. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. Hmm? Yeah, Tanya. So I just have, and, and I feel very un Buddhist saying this, but I'm going to say it. Just, um, you know, at the beginning, when they're talking about how, you know, uh, Buddha predicted that after like eons and eons and eons, then she'll become a Buddha. That can sound sort of discouraging on the one hand. On the one <laughs> hand, it's, it's like, great, I'm going to become a Buddha. And like, one shouldn't be fixated on how long it's going to take to become a Buddha. But on the other hand, it's like, wow, that's a freaking long time. It almost sounds like, it almost sounds like, like it might never happen. Which I, I don't think that's probably the intention, but that was, I sort of had a little bit of a reaction to that, so. Yep, I hear you. And there's actually a lot, a lot to that um, in a number of different ways. Um, so one of, the first thing of course, is it, it's part of the trope. It's part of it that this always happens 
Asamkya Samkya Kalpas from now. Um, and, you know, on that note, what they say is in, so let me, oh, this is an interesting uh, breakdown. Very, very, very simple breakdown that you may not have heard. In the Hinayana tradition, you don't get to be a Buddha at all. It's like, and especially women and all that, you definitely don't get to be a Buddha, but Buddhas are these rare, in the early tradition in the Hinayana, Buddhas are these rare occurrences. And it's so rare, it, it's like, it doesn't, it's not about you, it's not about, it's like, a, it's a Buddha. They might as well be aliens from another planet in that way. So that's in the early tradition, the Hinayana. In the Mahayana tradition, this sutra is going to later on, and Sri Mala is going to tell us, we all have Buddha nature, we all have the potential to become Buddhas, and we all will become Buddhas eventually, just some of us in kalpas sooner than others in that way, but it's still going to take a while. And so I want you to know that within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, yay, we all get to be Buddhas, but it might take kalpas and kalpas and kalpas. So we've, we've come a long way. <laughs> I say all of that so that you would maybe appreciate one way or the other that the third turning of the Dharma wheel, as it's called. So not the Hinayana, not the Mahayana, but the Vajrayana. So that third turning of the wheel, the Vajrayana, the way of the Vajra, what makes Vajrayana Vajrayana is they have this whole thing about Buddhahood in one lifetime. And it's very much appealing to Tanya's question. So when Tanya raised her question inside, I couldn't help but laugh in that way, because the idea is, is that other people have felt the way you have felt and other people have decided to speed things up a little bit. And so one of the things that makes tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism, Vajrayana is expediency. And then what they talk about is that we're the only Buddhists offering you Buddhahood in one lifetime. Not like those Mahayana bodhisattvas talking about asamkhya kalpas, right? So that's on that note. And regarding that too, just because I haven't said it yet, and I want to, um, I, I, I want to really emphasize this. This sutra is considered special and a little unique because this is a woman becoming a Buddha. And in, in a lot of other sutras, they still play this little game where very, very enlightened women still kind of need to take on the form of a man, even if it's just for appearances to make the other men feel more comfortable about the whole thing or something. Sutras get funny about this. But what I mean is, is that there is some you know, interesting sexual politics that go on in these sutras and in Buddhism. And this is an interesting one because it cuts right through a lot of um, like unclarity. So there's these other sutras where these very enlightened women transform themselves into men and it's to appease the other monastics that are uncomfortable with a woman becoming a Buddha. So they do this thing. And in the sutras, it's, it's clear that they're superior than these monks. It's clear that they're superior, but there's still this kind of sad deference to patriarchy, if I may. And so what is nice about this sutra is there's none of that. And Sri Mala does not need to change herself. She doesn't change herself. She's just Sri Mala all the way to Buddhahood. And so, and so we like this sutra. <laughs> all right, everybody, that's it for me. Uh, stay tuned because it just keeps getting better and better and better. So I hope to see you next Sunday night for part four. Thanks for being here. <laughs>